Let us pray. Our Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the way in which you draw alongside us when we most need you. These are dark and threatening times. We thank you that in you we have a steadfast anchor. Draw near to us through your word. We thank you that we can meet you in your word. And Lord, by your spirit, help us to know that the God whom we meet in Holy Scripture, the mighty, compassionate, life-giving God, he is with us today, each one of us, and with our families and with our loved ones. So strengthen us by your word and by your presence and make us a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. In the midst of the gloom of COVID-19, let us remember, my dear friends, brothers and sisters, that it is still Easter time. Let the victory of Christ's resurrection bring us a holy confidence in these testing times, a transforming power to our lives, and a radiant strength to our witness. I have spoken about our Christian response to COVID-19 in three areas. First, that we as Christians, as the Lord's people, should exercise social responsibility. Secondly, build small community. And thirdly, grow in spiritual desire. Let me elaborate a little bit on social responsibility. Foremost in our minds is the situation among the migrant workers. The exponential increase of infected cases among our migrant workers does expose weaknesses in our social system and flaws in our societal attitudes towards these workers who serve us so commendably in building up our nation. What we need to do, friends, is rather than point the accusing finger at any party, what we need to do is to work together, to take corrective actions, well, to take immediate actions in the interim and take corrective actions, uh, deep, systemic, and attitude-changing uh, changes uh, that will be needed so that the workers in this land have a much better way of life in our midst. So rather than blame, uh, let's work together. And government, uh, the foreign worker agencies, the employers, the NGOs, the dorm operators, let's work together to put things right. And I'm glad we're working vigorously in this uh, direction. So we all have a part to play. We learn from our mistakes. We become better people. We become a better society. We become a better church as we respond to gaps and to wrong, wrong ways of treating people so that together we are a stronger society for the future. So I thought I can mention that we as a church, we are also in God's grace doing our part in terms of social responsibility. So first in terms of the migrant workers, uh, several of our churches are involved in the adoption of what is called factory converted dormitories, as well as other dormitories as assigned by the Migrant Worker Center. And this is done in collaboration with NGOs. So the cathedral itself is one of the churches that's involved. And then we have members from different churches helping with the efforts to distribute food and care packs. Um, this is often in collaboration, again, with NGOs, but also with um, the HOPE Initiative Alliance and the Alliance of Guest Worker Organizations. So I can see different parts of the society. I can see the body of Christ 
coming together to minister to the needs of the migrant workers. Uh, we are also mooting a pilot project to build social cohesion in a dormitory. It's called uh, My Dorm, Our Home Project. And we are partnering with one of the major operators, but also with Far East Organization, which is a Christian organization. So that's on our migrant workers. I thought I should also encourage you by letting you know we're also working in the medical care for COVID-19 patients. So we have two wards in uh, our uh, St. Andrew's Community Hospital in Sime are now set apart and already uh, uh, providing treatment for those who are recovering from COVID-19. The capacity is at about 60 better. Uh, in addition to that, we are, some of our churches, uh, involved with the Ministry of Social and Family uh, Development, MSF, uh, in terms of providing housing for those who are, well, perhaps the category is rough sleepers. For some reason or other, they don't have a roof over their head. They're out in the streets and public places. So we are involved. I'm so glad that uh, Church of Our Saviour uh, uh, took the initiative when there was a need uh, as measures became tighter and workers could not return to their home countries to run a transit point in Margaret Drive. And now Coos is involved with a possible centre in, uh, in Wong Kok. Uh, so too, St. James has opened up its own premises, church premises, for about 10 people who need uh, transitional housing. So I, I share this with you, friends, uh, because all of us, as the people of God, we have a responsibility to the nation to serve the wider society. And then we want to build small communities. So you have some pictures in front of you in the slide. Uh, there is really a time now for us to build bonds. I, I think the photo on the slide is a bit idyllic. Uh, most families don't appear like that. <laughs> but sometimes in the midst of the pressure and so forth, we get to talk more. We get to share stories. We get to learn about each other's lives much more and to build that relationship. So there's small communities begin with the family. They don't end there. And I'm glad our cell groups are learning to connect. I think some of them weekly and some of them also informally using a Zoom and other means of social media. And then, of course, there is the need for us to care for others in the wider in our wider social circle, our classmates, our working colleagues, our uh, previous neighbors even. So we are here to build that small community. In terms of spiritual longing, I've already said to us, these are times when God draws us aside and we are hungry. We are hungry for the normative practices. But it's not just the practices. I pray we are hungry for God and we allow that relationship with God to grow. It's my joy to have embarked on this series of midweek online Bible uh, uh, studies, and the series is called Encounters with the Resurrected Jesus. Uh, last week, we had the first encounter, if you like, on the very morning of the resurrection. It was Mary Magdalene, and she cried out when she recognized that it was Jesus. She cried out, Rabboni. The point I wanted to draw from that study is that encounter with Jesus leads to a new experience of serving him with sweet devotion. So Rabboni is how Mary experienced the Lord in the days of his itinerant ministry. But now he is risen. And he says to her, don't hold on to me. I have not yet ascended. And there's going to be a new relationship. And for many of us, we're going to leave the past behind and rise to a new relationship with the Lord, a relationship marked by sweet devotion. Today, it is the road to Emmaus. And I'm going to be reading from the scriptures. You can turn your Bible to Luke chapter 24, and we're reading from verse 13 to 35. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus. 
I hope you have your Bible in front of you. Luke chapter 24, the words of course are also on the screen. Luke chapter 24 and starting to read at verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If Luke recorded the finest story Jesus ever told, that is the parable of the lost or the prodigal son, then the finest scene that Luke has sketched for us is this scene 
of Jesus encountering the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. It is so full of detail and so effective in the dramatic recounting of what happened. I want today, through this passage, or allowing this passage to speak to us, to look at the movement from disappointment to hope, from defeat to victory. How do you move from disappointment to hope? Hope is the certainty of a good, secure, and satisfying future. So how do you move from disappointment to hope? First, mourn our losses. The disciples are bitterly disappointed. Verse 21 says, uh, we had hoped. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped. We had no doubt that he was a prophet. It was clear he was mighty in deed and in word. But the two disciples, they had believed that he was more than a prophet, that he was the Messiah, the anointed king whom God had promised, who would come and save Israel and establish God's kingdom of righteousness and peace in Israel and indeed throughout the world. He is the Messiah, God's anointed king, to bring in a glorious age. So they expected him to be delivering his people, the faithful people who trusted in God, to be delivering them from pagan domination, not, not to be dying at the hands of pagan powers. We had hoped, but was not to be. And it looks like it's all over. It's now the third day. And then, well, maybe there's something something going on, so they recount, well, there were some women who early in the morning went to the tomb and could not find his body, and they saw a vision of angels who told them he's alive. And then some in their midst ran, ran to the tomb, and they found it, as the women said, empty, no body, but him they did not see. Anyway, it's all unclear, so as far as they're concerned, all their expectations have crashed. When your expectations have crashed, you are downcast. You are broken. It's not just that their expectations had crashed, my friends. These two disciples, possibly in the outer ring, would have known life with Jesus. Jesus had a wonderful way of being present with his disciples. They would have experienced how he would light up their lives because of how he understood and helped them to understand what God is like. That he is a God with a Father's love looking for the lost. He is holy, but in his holiness, he draws near. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And he came to save sinners. So all that would have lit their own soul. They would have had a very different way of living, with a different prospect of what, how God was going to use them. He had given them something to live for. And he would have loved them. But now he's gone. And so the light that came with him, with his presence, was no longer there. I think those of us who have known bereavement know something about this loss, the loss of someone very precious to you. The pain is deeper when there is sudden death or when someone dies 
at a younger age. So I was struck by what was in the paper, Straits Times yesterday, uh, words written by the widow of Kobe Bryant, the uh, superstar football, uh, basketball star of LA Lakers. He and his 13-year-old daughter died in a helicopter crash. So here's the wife. Her name is Vanessa. And on Saturday night, it was would have been their 19th wedding anniversary. So the Straits Times reported that Vanessa posted a picture of them, she and her husband, Kobe, on Instagram on 18th April with these words. My king, my heart, my best friend. I miss you so much. I wish you were here to hold me in your arms. I love you. We mourn our losses, crash of expectations, the loss of someone whom you love so dearly. And so friends, we come to this passage and our attention is drawn to verse 17 where Jesus asked them, what's this conversation you're having? It says in Holy Scripture, the two of them stood still, looking sad. You just can't keep going. And what happens is I think all of us experience losses in our life. And some of them are devastating. There is a loss of spirit. So our marriages break down. Then there's the pain some have experienced of miscarriage. Or your child rebels. Or someone you love is lost in the world of drugs. Someone betrays us. Our company retrenches us. Sometimes our parents reject us. Sometimes someone dies and you don't have the chance to repair or to affirm the relationship. So all of us have these losses. There's also the loss that some of us have experienced, the loss of our dream to be an upstanding person. Some of us dream of that, to be upstanding, to contribute, make a major contribution, and then there's the loss of that dream. So... In different ways, we all experience our losses. And I think I can say in some of the losses, we recognize that we have had a part to play. We recognize our part in the losses we experience. Our pride, our self-indulgence, our sinfulness, our busyness, our anger, our indifference. And that is why when we are convicted of this, of our part in the loss, we cry, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. From a contrite heart. The disciples' grief is connected with the evil they have witnessed. The chief priests and the rulers have destroyed viciously, maliciously, falsely accused and destroyed Jesus. They see the evil. But I think one can say they also recognize it's an evil that can be easily found in their own hearts. So Lord, have mercy. Friends, our losses in life, our sense of loss, puts us in touch with the losses of a suffering world. Famine. Young children dying for lack of food or clothing, AIDS, poverty, loneliness, pestilence, victims of violence. So the passage, the narrative asks this question, what do we do with our losses? And Jesus, by asking questions and listening, Jesus is helping us to mourn our losses. What does it mean to mourn? 
I use words from Henry Nouwen. When we mourn, we don't talk or act our losses away, but we grieve deeply. We allow our losses to tear apart feelings of security and safety and that all will be well or all is well. And we allow this sense of being torn apart, that we have lost something very precious. We allow this to lead us to the painful truth of our brokenness and often our emptiness. So as we follow this movement, the two disciples mourn their losses in the presence of Christ. I draw your attention also to the Lord's approach because I think it's really marvelous. The way the Lord comes, you know, notice again the handmade quality with which Jesus encounters his disciples. He does not overwhelm them into submission with his resurrection glory, no. He comes himself like a pilgrim, like a person on a journey and walks alongside them. It's a very beautiful revelation of what God is like. The disciples are kept from recognizing him. It's an indication, I believe, that Jesus uh, is Jesus, the same Jesus who was crucified, but with a transformed body, a body with new properties. In the language of 1 Corinthians 15, when the mortal puts on immortality. So they are kept from recognizing him. And his brilliant question opens the door to their sharing. It's a simple, direct question. What is this conversation that you are holding with each other? Our Lord listens, but he also speaks. And when he speaks in verse 17, we realize it's not a soothing conversation. Jesus speaking says, Oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe. The best counselors, my friends, go beyond comforting you to empowering you. And Jesus will now empower the two disciples by drawing their attention to Holy Scripture. So he's now going to unpack Holy Scripture. We read in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he's going to point out from the scriptures and the main message is that it was necessary for God's appointed, anointed king to go through suffering and then to enter glory. The disciples, like most of God's people, were expecting that God would deliver his people from suffering. But the scriptures were indicating that God would deliver his people through suffering. And in particular, the suffering of Israel's representative, the Messiah. In all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, there are clear prophetic passages in the Old Testament that had to do with the suffering servant. Isaiah 52, 53, Psalm 22, Zechariah. So the testimony is that this king will do his great work through suffering. Prophetic passages, but also the types in the Old Testament that foreshadow Christ, like the temple, the high priest, and the Passover lamb. In fact, friends, the way our Lord unpacks it is to let them know the whole story of God's people, of, of the world, and God's people was leading up to this absolute need for God to send a Savior, a Messiah. That only, the only way we could move out of this checkerboard experience of history Good times, bad times, but going nowhere. Where is it all going? It's all pointing to the coming of Christ. Because it's only through God's anointed king who takes Israel's suffering and the world's suffering onto himself, who dies under its weight and rose again to launch a new covenant, a new creation, 
and to constitute a new people of God. That's where it was all going. And Jesus is now unpacking it. No wonder their hearts, these two disciples, their hearts burn within them because the truth has come alive to them like never before. Uh, may I quickly add, that's how we need to read Holy Scripture, friends, or even to listen to a sermon. Always ask God to open your eyes and to burn the truth into your hearts so that you have the living word of the Lord. That's the first. We mourn our losses in Christ's presence. And what happens is Christ brings us the word of God that gives us life and hope and restores us. That's the first. So the second, in this movement from disappointment to hope, the second is tarry with Jesus. The disciples, well, firstly, I must say, and maybe there are some of you who are looking into, maybe haven't yet sealed a decision to receive Christ, but you are open. I want you to know the disciples were open to a stranger. They were open to a stranger who knew the scriptures and who knew how to connect the scriptures to unveil the purposes of God. So I'm glad you're with us in this series and I pray that you'll have a friend and you'll read scripture with God's help and see his glorious truth. So these two disciples, they're open and they're gripped by what the stranger is telling them. And then they take one step further. They actually want to hear him more, but it's expressed in terms of Middle Eastern hospitality. So they say to him, stay with us, for the day is far spent. Beloved, don't have a fleeting relationship or look in. Stay with Jesus. Stay with the word. Uh, let your need and let your instinct drive you on. Stay with the Lord. Perhaps I should also stay... Uh, and it's good also to stay with a community that you're part of. Stay with your church also. And no church is perfect. But if God has planted you in a community of people, stay with that community that earnestly worships and seeks the Lord. I, mean, I thought I should say this because it's easy to church hop these days. You can do it on the net. But I wanted to say to you, it's good to stay with the people of God you're part of, to trust God, to speak to you. Maybe I can put it this way. If you're also listening to other sermons and other worship services, add on, but don't substitute. Stay with your own congregation, and then you can have the liberty to add on. So they say these wonderful words, stay with us full of meaning again. Lord Jesus, don't, yeah, let it not be a fleeting moment. Stay with us. We can sense this life-giving, liberating truth in what you are saying. Then comes this poignant moment. Although Jesus is the guest, the risen Jesus now plays the host. And he breaks bread in his signature fourfold manner. He took he blessed, he broke, and he gave. These disciples are likely to have known his manner of breaking bread. They may not have been at the upper room, but in all probability, they would have been there in moments like the feeding of the 5,000. Again, this fourfold. And Luke could be well linking this passage with what the Lord did in the feeding of the 5,000, I am the bread of life, he would say in John's gospel. And the disciples recognize him. Verse 31, their eyes were opened. That brings me to the Lord's faithfulness to reveal. So there is their desire to receive, and then I thought you should know when you have that desire to reveal, to receive, 
God will always reveal. So their eyes were opened. Think again to the first meal in the Bible. The woman took some of the fruit. She ate and she gave it to her husband and he ate. Their eyes were opened. They became conscious of each other, embarrassed by their nakedness, awkward. There is already the loss of holy innocence. There is the, what is called the opposition of otherness. Their eyes were opened and they had sinned against God and it was a total fall, the total fall of man fallen in all his faculties and creation subjected to decay, futility and sorrow. It was the beginning of the woes that would come on the human race and death is traced to that moment of rebellion. So that's the first meal in the Garden of Eden, there in Genesis. But now another meal on the other side of Christ's resurrection. It's the first meal in the inaugurated new creation. Their eyes were opened, same phrase, and they recognized him. It dawned upon them, he's alive. And if he's alive, it's, it'll dawn on them, perhaps not all at once, but the new creation has begun. The long curse that has afflicted the world has been broken. Death itself has been defeated. It's the new creation has burst upon, brimming with life and joy and new possibility. It has broken upon the world of decay and sorrow. And in this glorious moment, he's alive. It's Jesus. He vanishes. I thought I would reflect on that for a moment because I think we all experience it, you know, in life. There are those, well, rare moments, but it's a perfect moment. This is one of those perfect moments. The risen Lord at the table with them. Oh, make it last. It should last. But it doesn't. He vanishes. When we experience a perfect moment, we all want to freeze the moment and prolong it forever. But friends, life is not meant to be a standstill moment. Perfect moments of bliss, they don't last on this side of eternity, but don't be discouraged. It's true, Jesus vanished, but his presence will be known and will be known by faith through all the changing scenes of life. So I want to invite you to enter into a dynamic, into the dynamic nature of life through all its ups and downs. Don't be hooked on these perfect moments. And don't lose heart when they don't last because he's God with us in the dynamic nature of life. He's with us and he will work all things for the good of those who love him. He may vanish in terms of your felt presence of him, but know this, he will never, no, never abandon you. He will not abandon your soul, not even in death. Tarry with Jesus. Two things caused the disciples to come to a burning conviction that Jesus is alive. One, Holy Scripture. Second, the breaking of bread. We need Holy Scripture, friends. And that's part of Luke's reason for capturing this in detail. I want to ask this question. Why does Jesus use Holy Scripture to help these two disciples out of their spiritual blindness? Why doesn't he just come, as we often say, life on life, existential encounter? Boom! I've met him. It's real. Why does he use Holy Scripture? I'm going to use words from Cardinal Newman who reflected on this. This is how he described it. I'm paraphrasing, but the substance of what he says is this. We need that objective vision in your faith and that satisfaction in your reason to build a solid relationship with the Lord. You need the objective vision in your faith and that satisfaction in your reason so that your relationship with God is solid. We need to build, friends, on the rock of God's word 
not on fleeting experiences and feelings. In fact, if you depend on feelings and experiences, I think it's Newman also who says you'll be feeding on flowers. We need the substance of truth and its truth in God's word. Why do we need the breaking of bread? Because God is present. Well, he's present in word and he's also present in the breaking of bread. God is present when we break bread in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished work and his coming in glory. So Luke wants us who are reading to know that the Christians of his day were able to have the presence of the risen Lord. He knows, Luke knows, that the physical presence of the risen Lord is, going, is no longer going to be available. He's going to ascend to the right hand of God in glory. Yet, the real presence, the presence of Christ by the Holy Spirit is real and it's experienced in the breaking of bread in a manner very similar, analogous to a mouse road. We need scripture and we need sacrament. Without scripture, sacrament becomes a piece of magic. Without sacrament, scripture becomes dry intellectualism. We need both in the life of the church. COVID-19 causes us to address this need. So pray for me and my team as we continue to seek the Lord. How do we make available? Well, word, we're doing it through online. But now we need to think, how do we make sacrament or if you like breaking of bread? How do we make breaking of bread available to God's people? We need to hear from him because he's shepherding the flock. So my friends, we're moving from disappointment to hope through this narrative. First, mourn our losses. Second, tarry. Tarry means stay with Jesus. Mm. Linger on. Yeah, trust him. Something will transpire because he is faithful. Third, we live for God. Because that's how this narrative ends. They, they recognize him, he's gone, but they say, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened to us the scripture? And now they're beginning to be filled with hope, the certainty of a good, secure, and satisfying future for us as Christians, an unending life with God, secured in eternity by Jesus Christ. Jesus has secured hope for everyone, friends, in every nation and from every background. The two disciples are so gripped that Jesus is alive. So gripped, you know, he's alive. Some, God has done something and it's for all the world. And they, well, maybe they haven't figured it out, but there's a holy excitement and they can't just go to sleep. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. And so we read that very evening, they make their way back to Jerusalem. Verse 33, And they rose that same hour and returned to, to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, who were also delirious with joy because the Lord, the resurrected Lord, had met with Simon, and they know he is alive. So I want to point out to you, the two disciples, they show us that there is a strength in fellowship. Can you remember? We're not meant to live the Christian life on our own. The two disciples, they know he's alive, but they need to run back and be well strengthened to enter the joy of the larger community. They build each other in the faith. And so you have photos on the slide. Yeah, we thank God. Please give attention to the small community and to your church because that's God's provision that faith may grow and weather the storm. The second is that they will soon be dispersed. They will be sent out. We're going to run ahead a little bit. It'll come up next week because Jesus meets with them and Jesus says, this gospel, repentance and forgiveness of sins, 
must be proclaimed in his name, in the name of Jesus to all nations. So be a part of God's mission. And these two, together with the disciples, are going to be sent out. I want to finish this way. You and I, as we come to this passage in Luke 24, we too are invited into the story to bring our losses to Jesus, to hear his word in Holy Scripture, to have our hearts burning with God's truth, to receive his presence through the sacred practice of the breaking of bread, and then to be sent out as messengers of hope and new life to a lost and needy world, not least in this time of gloom and darkness and danger and loneliness. So, from Mary Magdalene, we come to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And for the road to Emmaus, we learn this. Encounter with Jesus heals our disappointments and sets us free for communion and mission. Let us pray. Draw alongside each one of us, Lord, as we hear your word. Thank you that no one is rejected and no one is too far off. The God who draws near to those who are disappointed. Disappointed because of many reasons, Lord. For some of us, disappointed with ourselves. But thank you as we mourn our losses. We hear the word of Jesus. We know he's alive. He is the one who lifts us up, fills us with hope and peace and joy to share with the world. Heal us and set us free to bring the good news, to bring Jesus to others. In his name and for his glory, amen.
seal the promise your buried body began to breathe and I got the sigh 